All right, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for being here with us today for this Castle Po e Forum on audiology practice in a pandemic. <clears throat> We're just uh, getting ourselves set up here and we'll get started in just one minute as soon as the clock hits 12. And we are at 12 o'clock. So welcome. Thank you again for joining us for this Castle Po e Forum on audiology practice in a pandemic. Just a couple of quick housekeeping rules before we get started. If you have other applications running on your computer or device, maybe close those down in the background to help maintain a stable audio and video connection for the next hour. And this webinar will be recorded and the slides and the recording will be posted on the website in a few days. So welcome and thank you for being here with us today. So my name is Samita Joglakar. I am the audiology advisor and the manager of mentorship at Castle Poe. And I'm joined by two of my esteemed colleagues and I'll turn it over to Alex uh, for her to introduce herself. Thank you very much, Samida, and welcome. We are very pleased to be providing this webinar for you. My name is Alex Carling, and I am the Director of Professional Practice and Quality Assurance here at Castle Ho. So, Sarah. Yes, good afternoon to you all. My name is Sarah Chapman Jay, and I am the Advisor for Speech Language Pathology in pra Professional Practice and quality assurance. Great, thank you very much, Alex and Sarah. So let's get right into our webinar. This is what we will be covering today. Uh, the first half of the presentation, we will be reviewing some flow charts that we've developed, one for clinics, businesses, and employers. And a second is for you as the individual audiologist, as you're providing <clears throat> patient care in this ongoing pandemic. And if you look on your screen, you should see that both of these flowcharts are attached as handouts. So if you'd like, you can click on them and download them now. They are also on our website and I'll show you where. In the second half of the presentation, we'll get to your prof profession specific questions that you sent in and from the town hall. And then hopefully throughout and at the end, we'll have a chance to answer any questions that you have today. <clears throat> so how is the e-forum going to work? Well, as I said, questions submitted beforehand will be addressed. If you have a question that comes into your mind as you're watching, you can type it in the questions box on your screen. Sarah will be monitoring the questions and we will send out FAQs or individual responses for unanswered questions. So today's e-forum um, is based on the current information that we have from the Ministry of Health and from public health authorities. But we are, of course, living in a time when information is rapidly changing. You all know from maybe listening to the news that um, the province of Ontario is now beginning to open up. Depending on what part of the province you live in, you may be at a different stage of that reopening. And also, we know that that means that as audiologists, you may be at different stages in terms of restarting your practice as well. So the information that we're providing today, we hope will help you. We'll give you some uh, questions to ask, some very good information that you can apply to your practice in this ongoing pandemic. Because the information is changing so rapidly, what we tell you this week, it may not be true next week. So we will continue to inform you when we receive new information. And the way that we do that is by sending email communications. So please continue to look at the email communications that you receive from Castle Poe and continue to refer to our pandemic practice advice documents that we are actively revising. So I'd like to just quickly show you where you can find the information on the website. If you go to the main Castle Poe page, the first information that you'll see is the COVID-19 information. If you click on it, it will take you to a COVID-19 information page. And this page has the history of all the communications we've sent out since March 17th, 
uh, when the pandemic began. And then this is our uh, pandemic practice advice or providing patient care in a pandemic page. And this is where we have the pandemic practice advice documents that uh, we are continually revising with new information. You'll notice that number 11 and 12 there are the flow charts that we're presenting today. They're already up for you. We're also publishing FAQs and you'll see there is one on assessment and treatment adaptations for audiology that was just posted today, hot off the press. And then we have the recording and slides from the town hall there as well. <clears throat> okay, so let's get right into our first flow chart. And this is a flow chart that we've developed for organizations, um, employers, clinics, and business owners. And this is the entire flow chart, all of the information. And all of the information here in this flow chart has come from um, the Ministry of Health's amended Directive 2 that was released on May 26th, and also the Ministry of Health's um, COVID-19 operational requirements health sector restart document. So this is an important flowchart for all organizations. If you are uh, a clinic owner, you're operating and running your own clinic, you have staff, um, maybe you're in a leadership position as a professional practice leader or a team lead. So this is all information that is applicable that you should be thinking about for your organization. And so let's start at the top of this flowchart and talk about the organizational risk assessment and the point of care risk assessment. So let's begin with the organizational risk assessment. So the Ministry of Health is saying that all organizations should be going through this process of an ORA, organizational risk assessment. And what that basically means is that as an organization, you are going through a systematic way of um, analyzing your organization and figuring out what control measures you need to put in place for your organization to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 infection. I mean, really for all infections, but we're talking about uh, being in the COVID-19 pandemic. So the ministry says that this type of assessment is a precondition for restarting your services. And then another, another important aspect of it is that you would be providing training and education to your staff on your organization's risk assessment. So in thinking about this, you know, things that you would need to ask yourself are, okay, what is the healthcare setting here? Obviously a hospital audiology department is different from a private practice, um, is different from maybe a long-term care facility. And then you ask yourself, what is the patient population? So are you dealing with patients from infants to children to adults? Is it only an adult population? And then what actual clinical activities are you doing? Is it vestibular testing? Is it provision of hearing aid services? Auditory processing disorders assessments? So looking at all of these different things, the setting, the patient population, and the clinical activities, you figure out what are the risks, where are the risks, and then put in place various measures to mitigate those risks. Okay, and we're going to get into those measures in more detail specifically. <clears throat> so another important aspect of this whole process really is the point of care risk assessment. And Alex is going to get into this in a lot of detail um, soon in the presentation. So I'm not going to go into a lot of depth here. But basically, as a business owner, a clinic, an organization, you want to make sure that the point of care risk assessments are being routinely carried out for all patients, all care, and all interactions. You want to make sure that your staff understand the PCRA and how to carry it out. Okay, and we will be talking about this a lot today. All right, so we've covered the two top boxes in the chart, the ORA and the PCRA. Now let's move to the various specific measures that you would be taking within your organization. And interestingly, um, Castle Co, along with another a group of regulatory colleges, we consult with the public, with patients, essentially, um, through a group called the Citizens Advisory Group. And when that group was asked recently, what would you expect from a regulated healthcare professional if you were to go and see them during the pandemic for in-person services? These are the things that the public identified as what they would expect from us. 
So it's important to keep that in mind. So firstly, you're going to look at modifying and adapting your service delivery. So as an organization, you want to have a system to decide if patients actually need to come into the clinic and when, under what circumstances do they need to come in. And you want to try to implement a system of virtual care, and we're going to talk about that as well. So this is coming from the ministry. This is the ministry wants all health, regulated health professionals to be doing this, modifying and adapting service delivery, to limit the length and frequency of the in-person visits. Because in this pandemic situation, any in-person interaction does increase the risk of the virus spreading. Okay, so that's the first measure. Let's move to the next measure. So the next one is physical distancing measures. So this would involve things like having plexiglass barriers, redesigning the physical setting in the clinic, spacing out chairs in the waiting room, making sure you have furniture that's easy to clean, limiting the number of patients that come into the clinic at once, maybe even having markings on the floor to make sure that people stay two meters or six feet from each other. And then maybe a policy around providing masks for patients when distancing isn't possible, or having some type of policy where you ask patients and visitors to be wearing a mask when they come in to your organization. Okay, so let's look at the third set of measures. And these are around infection prevention and control and screening. So for infection prevention and control, things like having a policy for hand hygiene for your staff and for visitors, having signage up in the clinic to help guide people on you know, proper hand hygiene protocol, having office and equipment cleaning protocols, like I was saying before, depending on the clinical activities you're doing, you'll have different types of equipment, different types of rooms with different setups. And so you'll need to decide what type of cleaning, how often, have the right types of disinfectant, that sort of thing. And then getting into the screening. So you want to have active and passive screening. Active screening is, of course, when you call the patient beforehand or speak to the patient directly and ask them a set of questions and make sure that they are answering no to all those questions. They're not showing signs of COVID-19 virus. And passive screening is through signage. So signs that you put up in your clinic so that Patients and visitors can read through the questions themselves and sort of self-screen. Okay, and we have some examples of signage here. Um, everything from putting on personal protective equipment, hand washing, staying apart. The signs in the bottom left-hand corner, attention patients and avis aux visiteurs, those are examples of passive screening, signs you can put up so that people can screen themselves before they come in. And the Ministry of Labour has also provided some nice signage for retail spaces. So we've provided some links here for you that you can refer to that will, uh, will take you to that signage that was just on that last slide, last slide. Okay, and then finally, the fourth measure is personal protective equipment. So you will determine the use of personal protective equipment based on the patient screening that you do and based on your point of care risk assessment. But as an employer, um, as an organization, you want to make sure that your staff have an adequate PPE supply. And you want to ensure that staff have education and training on how to properly select, use, and dispose the personal protective equipment. PPE is fantastic and works really well but it has to be used properly, obviously. So having a mask that you know is around your chin or that does not cover your nose and your mouth and that is not tight to your face fitting properly, for example, that wouldn't be appropriate use, use of a mask. So the training around the use and selection uh, of PPE is very important as an employer. And we'll get more into PPE later as well. So that is the whole uh, flow chart for employers, clinics, and businesses. And finally, just one last point is, you know, let the public, patients, and families know what to expect when they come to see you and the steps that you are taking to keep them and yourselves safe. Like I said, the public does have these expectations from us. They will know that they're safe 
when they come to see you if they know that you are taking these measures. So you can publish your infection prevention and control measures on your website or somewhere in the clinic and inform your patients when you call them before they come to see you of the measures that you're taking and offer to answer any questions that they have. Okay, so if you have questions about that flowchart we just went through, go ahead and type them into the box, but I am going to move ahead to the next flowchart, which is for you as the individual audiologist as you're providing patient care in this ongoing pandemic, the different questions to ask and the different steps to take. And I'll turn it over to Alex, who's going to review this flowchart with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Smeeda. So yes, here is the second flowchart for you as audiologists as you provide care. Now, uh, just to remind you, it's actually, um, we have a, a, attached this to the presentation and it is on the website. Here it is in its entirety, but let's start right at the top. So you're going to hear this message quite a few times, but trust me, this is the message we are receiving loud and clear from the Ministry of Health. And that is, ask yourself what service can be provided by virtual care. And don't forget, you know, that would also include um, the use of telephone as well. Now, if you can provide parts uh, uh, of your service by virtual care, um, think uh, uh, what areas um, would lend themselves to virtual care. And actually, you have already submitted questions to Samida, and she is going to be covering in quite a bit of detail all about the different elements that can take place through virtual care. So that will be coming up in a minute. So no, you decide that you are going to see the patient in person. It is necessary. So let's now talk about step one. And there are two elements to step one. First of all, you're going to do your point of care risk assessment and you are going to do your COVID-19 screen. So let's start off with uh, the point of care risk assessment. Now, as Samita said earlier, we have developed some pandemic practice advisories. She showed you where they were on the website and we have one specifically about point of care risk assessment. Now, interestingly, it was the Chief Medical Officer of Health for Ontario who um, actually published that all regulated health professionals must carry out a point of care risk assessment before every and each patient interaction. So let us look at this in a bit more depth. Okay, now when we did our research for this, we were very interested to see that Public Health uh, Ontario um, had, uh, were recommending a point of care risk assessment long before the coronavirus pandemic. And so really, um, I think this is something we have learned through this pandemic, that this should be a routine part of our practice. And this is where we are going to actually ask you as a regulated health professional to carry this out because it is going to be dependent on your professional judgment, your knowledge, your skills, your clinical reasoning, and of course, education. Because you are doing something extremely important, you are assessing the risk of exposure to infectious agents. And you're doing this for each of your interactions with all of your patients, considering every task and in every type of different environment. So what we are recommending is that you ask yourself a series of questions before every patient interaction. Is the hazard present in the situation? Now we are talking about COVID-19, but there are many other infectious hazards, regrettably, that you should be aware of. What is the health status of the patient? You know the patient, or if the patient is new, do a thorough chart review, case history, and get to know the patient. Because your patient's uh, health status is going to be key in this point of care risk assessment. 
then ask yourself, what type of clinical task am I doing? Where am I doing the task? What sort of actions comprise the task? And what sort of actions will follow the task? And you are doing this point of care risk assessment because it focuses on what you have control over. And I think this is very important in, in um, an environment when we're feeling we're lacking in control. This is something that you do that you have control over because it helps you to decide what actions you are going to take to protect the patients, of course, but also to protect yourself against exposure to infections. So the results of your risk assessment will help you with your choice of PPE. It will help you with how you are going to uh, adapt your services. What part of the in-person intervention can um, you maintain your physical distancing, but what part are you going to have to break that six foot or two meter barrier? What are the cleaning measures that you are going to employ? Obviously before um, the patient interaction, but also you might have to be doing some cleaning during the patient interaction, as well as after the patient interaction. And really um, use this point of care risk assessment to help you to determine what equipment you need specifically for that patient and for that either assessment or follow-up appointment. Excellent. So I think that's, that's awesome. it for the point of care so, risk assessment. So Alex, I was just thinking as you were speaking that you part of adapting your practice would be, you know, making decisions around maybe I don't need to use this piece of equipment today. Sure. Or maybe sure. I could use this equipment in a different way um, so that I'm able to maintain some physical distancing from the client, so that type of thing. Absolutely, and also that, that you do an assessment and it might be um, that you decide, okay, um, I will just briefly go over the results with you, but I will also phone you up when you get home later on this afternoon, tomorrow, and go over the results with you in more detail. Right. So now let's move on to COVID-19 screening. And again, we do have a pandemic practice advice with a lot of information about the screening. So um, I'm sure you are all aware that we have been directed by the Ministry of Health that all patients and essential visitors must be screened for COVID-19 before the in-person appointment. Now, what is preferred is that you do this screening by telephone, or if you've got a virtual care system set up and your patients are comfortable using it um, by that service. Now, also what is useful about this telephone conversation is that you can talk to the patient about essential visitors, because you really do want to limit the number of visitors who accompany the patient. Preferably, there will be no visitors, but of course we understand that there will be many occasions where an essential visitor is necessary. So screening should occur um, the day, if possible, of the in-person appointment, or if not, as close to the appointment as possible. Now, there could be a situation where you cannot get hold of them by telephone and they turn up in person and you haven't done the COVID-19 screening. So you're going to be doing it in person. If you have to screen the patient or the essential visitor, because not forgetting, you know, uh, I am going to repeat myself, they'd have to be screened as well in person and stay behind a plexiglass barrier and wear a surgical or procedural mask. Now, um, we were talking about point of care risk assessment and saying that you should be doing it because you are the regulated health professional with the knowledge, skill and judgment. 
there is no interpretation with regard to the COVID-19 screening. So you could have administration staff in your office, in your clinic do it. You could have your colleagues do it um, uh, as well, because it is a yes, no response. Now, if you're in a situation where you don't have a plexiglass barrier, you might not in your clinic, or you might be doing a home visit, or you might be doing a long-term care visit. If you don't have that barrier, keep a six foot, two meter distance from the patient, and in addition to the mask, wear eye protection, such as goggles or a face shield. So now, let us talk about taking temperatures because we have had a few questions about this. We did contact the Ministry of Health and they said it is entirely optional. It is your decision. They are not asking you to do it, but they're saying if you want to, you can. So if you choose to follow this, make sure you use a thermometer with disposable tips or a non-contact thermometer. So you've done the screen and you, uh, the um, patient responds no to all of the screening questions. So they are considered COVID-19 negative and you may see the patient in person. However, if that patient responds to any of the questions with yes, then that patient is considered to be COVID-19 positive and you should defer seeing the patient in person unless it's an emergency. Now, I'm going to touch on this briefly, but rest assured, Samida is going to go into a little bit more depth. So let's think about um, the positive uh, um, patient who screens positive for COVID-19. Now, if you are going to continue to see them, you need to follow the droplet and contact precautions. And Sunida will be going into that. But most of the time I foresee you will be deferring the uh, appointment. So in that case, make sure that the patient is well masked, carries out hand hygiene immediately and isolate that patient from everyone else in your office, in your clinic. So if you think that the patient's medical condition is urgent, send that patient to the nearest hospital emergency department. If you think their situation is non-urgent, you're going to just defer the appointment, also recommend that the patient get tested for COVID-19 as soon as possible. And in the pandemic practice advisory number three, COVID-19 screening, we have a lot of resources for you, links to assessment centers, to public health units, and of course, Telehealth Ontario. So you can help the patient find where to get tested. Now, just before I end my section, we're going to focus on you because you should be screening yourself on a daily basis when you're providing care to, in, to persons, um, patients in person. You should be um, screening yourself. And in that uh, practice advisory, number three, you will find a link to a self-assessment. So get onto that self-assessment, take yourself through every single day that you are going to be seeing patients in person. So we have completed step one. Now let's move to step two. So with step two, if necessary, reevaluate the point of care risk assessment. Here is where you're going to decide what PPE you're going to use. Obviously, you're going to perform hand hygiene before the patient's appointment. And just to remind you, limit visitors to those who are essential. If they are essential, make sure that they have undergone the COVID-19 screening. So now let's think about step three 
and actually providing services to the patient. So you're focusing on those clinical activities that must be done in person. However, as Samita said a bit earlier, continue to think about adapting those services as needed. You're going to follow the organizational policies around infection prevention and control before the patient, during the patient visit if necessary, and afterwards, and in between patients. So really, you will have done your analysis um, about the office area, what is going to be touched by the patient and therefore must be clean. You're going to be thinking of cleaning the sound booth, any equipment that you used. And uh, of course, during the intervention, you're going to be thinking about physical distancing measures, hand hygiene, and as Samita said, proper donning, doffing, and disposal of PPE. So I think we have completed the flow chart. It's there for you. And Samita, I believe we are now open to questions. So mm -hmm. Sarah, are there any questions about the two flow charts? Yes, thank you, Alex and Samida. Um, I'm going to offer the one question here. Uh, there's more than one question, and I'm going to apologize on behalf of everybody. I can see already we will not be addressing all the questions in one in this session. But um, this question, is it okay to use an abbreviated screening, such as asking a few questions, such as have you experienced any recent flu-like symptoms, or must every item of the screening be asked? Um, Samita, I can take this if you like. So um, this comes from the Ministry of Health. It's not coming just from us, Castle Poe, but of course our role is to communicate out the requirements of the Ministry of Health. And the Ministry of Health are asking you to complete the full screen, most definitely all of the questions. Now, I believe there are only five, but I also believe that uh, one of the question has a lot of subcategories. And they are asking you to do this before um, uh, every patient um, interaction. Yes, you must do the four. Yeah, I would agree. And um, one thing I would just add is I, I have gotten some questions about, and Alex mentioned it, um, is it important to screen on the day? Um, because if you screen someone on a Wednesday and you're not seeing them until Friday, their answer to one of those screening questions may have changed. You know, things change quickly, uh, even when people are have the virus. So screening as close to the in-person appointment is also very important. And yeah, I'm, I'm with you, Alex, that all of the questions would be important to ask. And I think to help you on a practical level, just to remind you, it doesn't have to be a regulated health professional to carry out the COVID-19 screening because it is there is no interpretation required. It's just yes or no. Okay, so should we move to the next part um, of the presentation, which is getting into the profession specific questions? And um, if there are more questions about the flow charts, perhaps we can come to them if there's time at the end, or again, we will send individual responses or have FAQs. So I'm gonna get right into these. Um, thank you for sending me the questions in advance. And these are the most common ones that uh, I've been getting, we've been getting um, in practice advice. So the first question is, is simulated real ear measurement acceptable for hearing aid fitting? Uh, during the pandemic? And the answer to this question is yes. Um, SREM meets the minimum expected standard of practice for verification. And that's standard H12 in the practice standards for the provision of hearing aid services by audiologists. And that would be true in the pandemic or otherwise. SREM is a validated uh, evidence-based procedure for verification, and it meets Castle Poe's minimum standards. And I think it is a good practice adaptation for audiologists because by using SREM, you are 
limiting the number of in-person appointments, the frequency and length of the in-person appointments. So a good practice adaptation. But I think it's important to be aware of the drawbacks of SREM. For example, we know that there is less accuracy in low frequency fittings, in particular when it's a very uh, vented fitting. And also we know that SREM is most accurate with an individual RECD measurement. So if you will be doing SREM on a routine basis and you don't have an individual RECD and for many vented fittings, then verifying sound quality with validation and proper follow-up become very important cross-checks. And of course, validation and follow-up for the patient are minimum expected standards for audiologists in the practice standard as well. So use your judgment as well to determine when in-person REM is needed for a patient given the circumstances. If I reflect on my own clinical practice when I was fitting hearing aids, I can think of some patients where SREM was good. You know, you fit the hearing aid in the test box to targets and you put it on the patient's ears and they feel good about the sound quality with minimal adjustment. But then there are some patients where you need to do a lot of adjusting um, even if you have preset that hearing aid in the test box in a simulated manner. So this is where your professional judgment comes in. You might need to see that patient in person for REM measures. In-person REM, of course, is the gold standard, but SREM, as I said, meets minimum standards of the college and is a good practice adaptation, particularly in this time we're in right now, um, where the ministry is telling us to you know, limit in-person visits. Okay, so I'm just going to do the next question as well, and then I'll stop to um, see if there are any questions we can address. So the next common question in practice advice has been, are virtual hearing assessments acceptable? So let's discuss this a little bit. So currently, a virtual audiometric assessment does not meet the minimum expected standards of practice for audiologists in Ontario because the current practice standard for assessment of adults and assessment of children requires a soundproof booth that meets ANSI standards for ambient noise levels. It requires manual audiometry with a dual channel audiometer and bone conduction testing and otoscopy for every assessment. So I would just like to let you know that we are aware that these standards need to be revised and we are in the process of revising them because I know from speaking to many of you, from attending conferences and so on, that audiologists are doing a lot more assessments outside of the soundproof booth. And those assessments are, are valid. Um, you know, audiologists are getting a lot more out into the community, home visits, um, retirement homes, schools, and this is really important work. So we know that the standard needs to be updated so that it's more current. But I just think it's important for you to know that right now, as it stands, doing a full audiometric assessment virtually, it, it doesn't meet the minimum expected standards. Also, in speaking to many of you, I realize that virtual assessments are difficult. We, we still have challenges when we're doing them, and they may not be in the best interest of the patient or comprehensive enough, particularly if it's the very first ever assessment of a patient versus reassessment of a known patient. You know, you know this patient, you know their case history and their hearing loss, and you're using the virtual assessment to confirm that hearing has changed or has minimally changed or hasn't changed. That's very different from doing an entire first assessment. It's hard to do it comprehensively. How will you do otoscopy? How will you do bone conduction? You might be limited in these things particularly if there isn't a support person or a helper on the other end, if the patient can't, can't position the bone conductor or the earphones, there's, there's challenges with this. Okay, so are virtual hearing assessments acceptable? From Castle Poe right now, the answer is no, because they don't meet the minimum expected standards. But as we're discussing, we're in a, an exceptional time right now. The ministry is encouraging us to adapt our practices. So if you divert from the minimum expected standard for assessment, then you have to have a clear clinical rationale for why you're doing so and make sure that you document it. 
make sure that you weigh the risk of patient harm using a virtual assessment versus patient benefit. And keep the patient's best interests at the forefront of making this decision. And of course, ensure any assessment data that you collect is accurate and reliable, especially if you're going to use that data to plan the next steps in the care, like a hearing aid prescription or another recommendation you're going to make. You want to make sure you're using reliable and accurate data to make those recommendations. So let's think of an example. Let's say you have an adult patient who is undergoing cancer treatment. They are immunocompromised, but you know them. You've been working for them with them for a while and they're having trouble with their hearing. They're having trouble with their hearing aids. They need your help, they're struggling. So in that case, you need to ask yourself, what is the risk of bringing the patient in? Okay, well, they're immunocompromised, perhaps the risk of actually bringing them into the clinic is higher risk than trying to do a virtual assessment to try to help them because you do know them. So that's the type of you know, uh, weighing of the risks that we're, we're trying to ask you to do. So the risk of bringing the patient in outweighs trying to do the virtual assessment. And that's the type of clinical rationale we're talking about. If you have that kind of rationale, you could decide to attempt a virtual assessment but make sure you document your rationale and be ready to adapt. If it's not going to work out, if, if the data is not accurate enough, then maybe that's when you have to decide, no, I, I, I need to bring this person in. Okay, so I'm going to take a pause there and see if there are any, maybe one question that could be addressed. Hello again, Samida. Um, so Hi. the question, this time is they've heard that uh, this person says, I have heard we should wait 15 minutes after a room is used before cleaning due to droplets still settling in the air. Have you seen this or heard this from public health? Okay, so that has to do with the sound booth and using the sound booth and cleaning of the sound booth. Um, the recommendation in the pandemic practice advice is to consult directly with the manufacturers, um, but also uh, you would need to consider how the sound booth is set up in the room, in the building that you're in. So I have heard that if the sound booth is connected to the HVAC of the building, then leaving the door closed and leaving the room uh, uh, empty for 15 minutes is, is a good idea. If the sound booth is not connected to the HVAC, then maybe you actually need to leave the door open um, or follow some different protocol. Um, but one thing I would say, some advice that I have been giving is making sure that the, making sure that you do the COVID screening before the patient comes in, making sure that they're COVID negative, and then asking them to wear a mask for the whole time they're gonna be in the sound booth, if you can, very important. Because if the patient is wearing a mask and they end up sneezing or coughing, those droplets are going to get caught in the mask. And the chance that they're going to get onto surfaces or onto the walls of the sound booth, it's minimized. Okay, so um, I don't have a specific answer for is it definitely 15 minutes, but I would give that additional advice of COVID-19 screening, very important, and then asking that patients wear a mask. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop there. We'll keep going. We have some important ones to get through. So the next question: Any guidance on what else in audiology can be carried out using virtual care? So in thinking about this, I think that if there is um, a positive note we can have, or, or a silver lining in the situation that we're faced with, it's that audiologists can can now begin to really embrace and learn about how to include more virtual care in, in the work that they do. So I think that any aspect of an assessment or treatment that is conversation-based, you could do through virtual care. So calling the patient through a real-time video call to do the case history component and have the consent discussion before they come in. Um, all of the conversations you have around determining hearing aid candidacy, their hearing and communication needs, lifestyle and personal factors, economic considerations, their motivations and expectations and goals. All of this could be discussed through virtual care. And the nice thing about this is 
they are in their own space if they're at home and they're not trying to imagine what life would be like. They, they're in their space, so it's much more realistic for them to have the discussion and you can involve family members in the discussion, so there's lots of advantages to this. Okay, and uh, the other thing is if you do these parts of your assessment virtually, then when you actually are with the patient in person, you can really focus on the things that need to be done in person, like the audiometric assessment or ear mold impression or otoscopy or whatever it is that you need to do. So adapting your practice, this is part of adapting your practice and focusing your time in the in-person appointment. Okay, more things that could be done. Hearing aid validation questionnaires, making sure that they're hearing well and doing well. Adjustment of hearing aid settings remotely, maybe even over a real-time video call if the technology is in place for it. Oral rehabilitation, counseling, how-to demonstrations and troubleshooting, how to place the hearing aids in the charging dock, how to change a wax guard. And these same principles can apply for other practice areas, like if you're working in tinnitus, vestibular treatment, auditory processing disorders. Maybe there's a way to adapt your uh, treatment to do it virtually, teaching people vestibular exercises after they've had their in-person assessment. You could teach them those things virtually. But of course, you're gonna continually evaluate if the virtual care is appropriate. You know, it, it may not be suitable for every patient. And so that's where your judgment comes in. You know your patient best, and you should be able to decide if these things are gonna work through virtual care or not for each specific patient giving, given uniquely who they are. Okay, Me, I'm uh, gonna take... Yes. This is Alex. And just um, uh, another sort of unforeseen advantage about this, um, is that um, patients' experience with virtual care has increased significantly as, you know, their Zoom calling their family, um, you know, their Zoom calling their physician, etc. If we mm -hmm. were saying this before the pandemic, it, it would be a real struggle for many patients. But, you know, uh, one of the small unforeseen benefits is people are much more comfortable with this technology. That was it. Yes, yes definitely. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to take us through the PPE questions because uh, we got a lot of questions about this in the town hall and in practice advice, and then I'll take another pause. So do audiologists need to wear full PPE with every patient, including gloves and an isolation gown? So again, we've been through this in the earlier part, but the choice of PPE is based on the COVID-19 patient screening and the point of care risk assessment that you carry out. And the screening and the PCRA results help you determine the level of precaution to take and the PPE that you need to use. All right, so for patients who screen positive for COVID-19, we recommend the following, or the ministry recommends the following, defer the in-person appointment, adapt your services if possible, and provide virtual care as much as possible. If you have to see or are required to see a patient who screens positive or, or even has COVID-19, maybe you work for an ENT clinic and there's an emergency case in a hospital setting, you might have to see patients who screen positive or who even have the virus. In that case, you're gonna carry out your point of care risk assessment. Always very important step. What are you doing? Where are you doing it? Who is the patient? What characteristics do they have? And then if they screen, they've screened positive or have the virus, you are going to follow droplet and contact precautions. And those are, you wear a surgical procedure mask or a medical grade clear mask. You wear an isolation gown, gloves, eye protection in the form of goggles or a face shield. And you perform hand hygiene before and after contact with the patient, the patient environment, and after the removal of the PPE. And that's for all interactions within or closer than six feet to the patient or two meters, same thing, six feet, two meters, same thing. 
for patients who screen negative for COVID-19, so they've answered no to all of the questions in the screening, you carry out the point of care risk assessment. Again, always important. What activities are you doing? Where are you doing them? And who is this patient that I'm seeing? And the recommended PPE for patients who screen negative from Public Health Ontario is you wear a surgical procedure mask or a medical grade clear mask or a face shield. You consider eye protection if you're not using a face shield and hand hygiene always imperative. You're going to perform hand hygiene. Um, gloves and a gown are not required unless you determine they are needed from your point of care risk assessment. So an example for, of that would be let's say you have a patient coming in and you've screened them before the appointment, they've screened negative, but you know that this patient has had a stroke and they have trouble controlling their saliva. In that case, maybe you are going to be touching their face, their ears, you know this about them, so you may decide, I know they've screened negative for COVID-19 and I don't have to, but I am going to wear gloves and a gown in this case. Okay, so that's an example of when you might decide it's, it's needed. A little bit more about face shields. So Public Health Ontario recommends that for optimal protection, the face shield should extend below the chin to the ears, and there should be no exposed gap between the forehead and the shield's headpiece, ensuring that no part of the face is exposed is absolutely essential. Okay, what about homemade masks that are washed daily or other non-medical grade PPE? So the guidance from the ministry is that health professionals are advised by the ministry to only use medical grade PPE. It would be okay for the patients or family members to wear uh, homemade masks or face shields that they've made at home, a scarf that they brought from home. That would be uh, okay, but it's not advised for regulated healthcare professionals who are providing in-person patient care. And I think it's important to remember that PPE is protecting you from potentially maybe getting an infection, but it's also protecting the patients from you because we as health professionals could pass the infection to our patients. And I think that's one of the reasons why the ministry is saying only medical grade PPE for the health professionals. Okay, what about PPE requirements for infants and children? The Ministry of Health does not expect infants, toddlers, or preschool children to wear masks. Masks are recommended for school-aged children, but only if tolerated. They shouldn't be forced. Again, you as the audiologist are expected to wear the PPE according to the recommendations we've just given if you will be closer than six feet to the child and parents and guardians who accompany the child should wear a mask or face covering. Okay, so that uh, is the end of the PPE and I'll take a pause and see if maybe we can take one question. Okay, thank you, Samida. Um, this question is more to do with the consent conversation. Um, what is needed when providing virtual care and consent? Okay, that's a great question. And maybe I'll just say a little bit and then ask Alex or even you, Sarah, to chime in. But um, we have the consent conversation for virtual care is, of course, an important component. And we do have information that we've added to the consent tool to help guide you through these consent conversations. A link in this presentation is provided. Um, but uh, is there anything else, Alex or Sarah, that you'd like to add? Um, I think when you're thinking of providing virtual care, you have to think about obtaining consent to the two elements. One is you're containing, obtaining consent for virtual care, and you are obtaining consent for your plan of care or for your assessment. And uh, as Samida said, we have added language to cover both um, uh, consent processes to collect, use and disclose personal health information and um, consent for treatment assessment. So have a look at the consent tool 
but also um, I think Samida you are talking a little bit later about the new consent standards that are out for stakeholder response. I will mention them yes. Excellent. Sarah do you want to add anything? Yes, yeah, sorry, Alex, just um, the virtual care standards are out um, for yes. stakeholder response. What is Fantastic. Consent. Okay, it, which yes. is in uh, there, which is also in there, which is excellent. Yes. <laughs> right. Um, okay, yeah, let's that's good. Shall I? I'll keep going. We have two more questions and then and then we've reached uh, the end. So. So another common question I've been getting in audiology practice advice is, do equipment calibration schedules need to be maintained if facilities are strictly limiting uh, off-site personnel from entering the building? And I think right now, because the province is slowly opening up, these types of restrictions are not as much uh, in place. But we don't know what the future holds, as I was saying. And um, if there is a second wave, and restrictions have to come in place again, this question might come up again. And also you may have, uh, the, there might be a long waiting list for calibration because we were in lockdown for three months. So the answer to this question is yes, the calibration schedules do need to be maintained. We would advise that you make reasonable attempts to meet this minimum standard. For audiologists, it is a minimum standard for us to make sure that our equipment is calibrated and in proper working order. And that standard is in our code of ethics, it's in our practice standards, and it's in the self-assessment tool that we complete every January. If you cannot meet this minimum standard of practice for reasons that are beyond your control, maybe you work in a hospital, the hospital has restrictions and you can't control those, you're working for a particular organization or employer and they have restricted certain things and you feel like you can't control it, then your, your responsibility as a regulated healthcare professional is to make attempts to meet the standard and document those attempts. So the attempt might be to have a meeting, a conversation with your professional practice leader, your manager, and explain to them that you are regulated by a college, the college has standards, show them the practice standard, explain to them why this practice standard is important, and document that you've done that. Okay, and then finally, have a plan in place for how to manage assessments if you're going to need to do assessments with equipment that is past calibration. So are you going to be able to compare your results with other equipment that is still in calibration? Can you weigh that balance of benefit versus harm? Maybe there are certain assessments you can defer until the equipment is calibrated. Other assessments where gathering a little bit of data, even though the equipment is out of calibration, would be more of a benefit than a harm. So have that type of plan in place if you think that you're going to need to do lots of assessments with equipment that won't be calibrated in time. Okay, and then one more frequently asked question is, are home visits considered acceptable in this climate? And the answer is yes, home visits are acceptable. But as long as you are carrying out all of the steps that we've outlined in the flow charts, you need to carry out the COVID-19 screening, you need to do the point of care risk assessment. Again, that point of care risk assessment is so, so important because it helps you determine, you know, choice of PPE, judiciously using PPE. It helps you determine what physical distancing measures you need to put in place, what equipment you're gonna use, and the cleaning that you're gonna to have to do and the adaptations that you can make. And of course, you're always gonna ask yourself, can any part of this be done virtually? Because if, if, if it can, then that's going to make it um, easier for you to concentrate your time during the in-person visit. Okay, another important aspect of this is speaking to the patient beforehand, because before you go into their home, you want to make sure that the patient knows what to expect. You know that you are gonna be wearing PPE, you maybe want to ask them to wear a mask and wash their hands before you arrive and ask them to have any family members or visitors outside of the area where the appointment will take place. Okay, so we have reached the end of the question and answer section of the presentation. I am realizing that we are very close to time. Um, is there maybe one last question we could address 
um, Sarah? Yes, uh, this I think is a quick question. Does the point of care risk assessment have to be documented? Good question, thank you. My uh, initial reaction to that is yes, you should document that you've done the point of care risk assessment. Yes, um, um, Samita, yes. I would agree with you. And, and what we're saying about um, documentation in, in this sort of era of COVID is if you have developed policies about point of care risk assessment, about anything, infection prevention and control, cleaning, et cetera, and then you can, we're thinking of helping you to document efficiently. So you can um, just document that you've done the point of care risk assessment as per your policy um, and um, the following decisions have been made. You, uh, you don't have to sort of, um, you know, every single time document, you know, the, the actual questions because you've already got a policy. Um, and so uh, you can refer to that in your documentation. Have I made sense, Nita? Yeah, no, I totally agree. That's the great advantage of going through that process of developing a policy. Yes. You know, going back to the very first flowchart, organizational risk assessment. If you come Absolutely. up with a policy for how you're going to do the point of care risk assessments based on your practice, then it makes your documentation very easy because then, as Alex said, the documentation is carried out point of care risk assessment as per organizational policy. Yeah. That is now documented. And if anybody ever asked you, well, what's your policy? You have it to show them. Yes. So, perfect. Okay. Um, I know that there may be lots of other questions, but we are one minute over time. Um, I am going to just take us through the last few sets of slides. So we are continuing to support you. Um, there will be additional e-forums. I think we have a topic for one later this summer, which is going to be school board uh, information on um, working in the school board for SLPs and audiologists. I know that there are audiologists in the school board as well. We will be putting out additional pandemic practice advi as advisories uh, if required and developing more FAQs. And of course, we are here for you. We're the practice advisors. Alex is our director. Um, but we all answer practice advice questions and we are here. Please continue to keep in touch with the college and contact us if you have questions that you're encountering. And um, we just want to say, you know, thank you again for being here and for all of the hard work that you're doing. This is a challenging time for everyone and continues to be challenging for lots of different reasons. But we very much appreciate your efforts to provide quality care and we're here to help you from the regulatory perspective. Um, so please stay in touch with us. And just a couple of very quick points to make on virtual care. So like we mentioned, we have a revised consent tool with new information on the consent conversation for virtual care. So when you're getting consent, what to say, what to ask, please go into the consent tool and have a look at that. It will be helpful. And then also the virtual care practice standards are out now for stakeholder feedback. This is your opportunity as audiologists to have your say on the standards. If there's something that has not been captured, something that you encounter and you feel that it's not included, this is your chance to let the college know. Very um, apropos for this time because we're doing more and more virtual care. So please have a look at the standards and send the college your feedback. And before we say thank you and goodbye, is there anything, Alex or Sarah, that you would like to add? I don't think so, um, with one exception of reiterating our thanks from the college to you for how you've adapted in this uh, completely new world of healthcare delivery because of the pandemic. Thank you, um, really. Uh, we have a, a, a fabulous um, group of registrants, fabulous audiologists, and we, we really um, admire you and uh, how you've managed in this pandemic. Thank you uh, for joining us and um, have a nice afternoon. Thank you.